We have major breaking news pertaining to Project Veritas and James O'Keefe. He has been placed on paid leave over some kind of controversy involving the firing of a chief financial officer. I have a Twitter thread from one individual breaking down what happened. And I can say right now that I have the letter drafted by the employees making complaints about James O'Keefe. And uh, I'm with James O'Keefe on this one. Look, I don't know a whole lot about the internal workings of Project Veritas. I just know that James O'Keefe is Project Veritas. So what we're hearing is that there's some uh, disgruntled employees who have filed, who who have issued their complaints about uh, James O'Keefe, and that in some instance, apparently he tried to fire an individual or, or more, which resulted in the board taking the action of removing James O'Keefe. All this at a time when uh, infighting and drama among the anti-establishment and the culture war right seems to be reaching critical mass. So it is what it is. Uh, I can't tell you why it's happening. It is just it's happening everywhere. And especially considering Project Veritas recently just came out with one of its biggest stories ever, exposing an executive from Pfizer talking about what people would colloquially describe as gain of function research. This comes off as highly suspect. Why now at Project Veritas's biggest moment? And they've had many big moments. Don't get me wrong. The Amy Rohrbach tapes where they exposed how ABC News covered up the Epstein interview. Why right now is this all happening? It seems tactless. Why would if, if Project Veritas had a problem, if the board members had a problem, why would they not simply say, guys, we're going to wait? Maybe they can't. I don't know. But let me know what you think. I'm sure there are a lot of people who have their concerns uh, or issues with me because I've certainly been in a mood, as it were. But um, I think it's time we have a serious conversation about the, the, the bifurcation and the fracturing and the collapse in the unity that we've seen in the culture war right, as it would be described. And uh, we need we, 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 we have to address it. We have to absolutely address it. Look, man, you know, it's one thing when you feel personally slighted or you're upset about the way an organization is operating. But let me just stress right now between the Daily Wire and Steven Crowder, um, between me and and, and the quartering and anyone else involved in that, between Project Veritas and James O'Keefe, yet we can't have this. We absolutely cannot. We can have our differences. We can have our disagreements. But if this persists at this level, especially after I just covered a story at 1 p.m. about two Republicans now being killed, This will be the end of whatever it is we are all trying to accomplish. Whatever the fuck we're trying to accomplish, (laughs) whatever that may be. I mean, you tell me. What's the Tim Pool theory of the case that like all these people who worked for Project Veritas, all these people on the Project Veritas board are just like working for the deep state. And so they're like ideologically out to get James O'Keefe. It's like Project Mm -hmm. left to toss yeah. It's, it seems like the deep, the deep states everywhere, man. They, they've got their, their 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 fingers in everything. <laughs> it seems like right. He was implying that criticizing Pfizer or, or, or let's say uh, for, for Pfizer, Pfizer like is is uh, holding the strings. Exposing Pfizer was a bridge too far, I see. and yeah. Pfizer somehow. Which what's 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 really good is when you could just kind of do that move of like I don't know. I mean I don't know. There's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of yeah. pieces there. Like, let's say for the sake of argument, that guy really was a Pfizer executive and, and, you know, what he was saying really was as bad as they were interpreted as being. And so this is like the one case where Project Veritas has like actually exposed something that might matter. Uh, I, you know, I mean, look, if I was going to place bets on that, I don't know that, you know, I'll just leave that unsaid. But they have a, uh, but like, um, Let's assume for the sake of argument, all that's true. I still don't understand how it is that Pfizer, what, like hypnotized, like all of the uh, employees and board members of Project Veritas into, uh, into defaming James O'Keefe for them. Oh, I'm sure they have a drug for this, right? They have a specific <laughs> mind control drug. Come on. It's in the water, people. They put it in the water. The frogs are gay. Oh, no, we really got it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we went at the Project Veritas office, but now I guess we have yeah. to. And, yeah, and, and, exactly. And look, and look, you know, all those things described in that letter 
I've done that to my employees too. I've been in a mood. You're probably going to see allegations coming out about me yeah, very soon. Say that, like, I was in the like the tin cast, you know, compound, and like I like lined up a bunch of employees in a dog pile, and I was like, uh, and I was literally peed on them. Allegedly. And it's like, look, maybe that happened. Maybe it didn't happen. Like, that's not the point here. The point is some Republican somewhere who was a politician maybe died. And I, I don't know if he's claiming Pfizer assassinated them or like that part was very confusing. <laughs> but like then there's been this beef with Stephen Crowder and the Daily Wire. And I don't know, man. It just seems but... like a lot going on. And like there's something, something's <laughs> going on here. Look, the Tim cast yeah. is Tim Pool, you know, so no matter what I might say or do to you. Yeah, it doesn't matter. What, like, whoever, you know, whoever I may have peed on, you know, like, like, like that's, that's not the point. We've been talking about, you know, we've been talking about Tim's thoughts about James O'Keefe, but uh, I am interested in, uh, in Tim's thoughts about some of the greatest thinkers in, uh, in the history of western philosophy so they they find what works well in what regions um that's why the west is still promoting you know azov battalion and that stuff in ukraine now right i thought we we're supposed to be against nazis right america right but in the ukraine it's cool i mean it makes no sense right but it makes sense from a geopolitical strategic standpoint so absolutely like the the point was to deplete destroy russia ultimately for integrating every everything into a technocratic order that was the plan 100 years ago what we're seeing now so yeah, I guess it sounds like it was the plan two thousand years ago with Plato, but he, or at least he was giving the philosophy. Well, the plan hadn't. Yeah, I think Pla Plato thought that you could have a like a city state, but I don't know if he thought like the whole world would com you know conform to this. Maybe he thought that. I think later Platonists, like in the Middle Ages, thought we could take that model and it actually should be the whole world. I mean, you even see this in Enlightenment philosophers, like you know Kant has a whole thing about how to create a world government. Hmm. It's like evil Griscom over there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you, you guys are the philosophers. I don't really remember my plan out too well for this. I'm I'm trying to remember the Republic. It didn't sound very one world government -y to me. He was like, "There's a <laughs> individual thing called a city state, but what yeah. if? What if he? What if meant the entire world was one city state?" Yeah, yeah. Is there more to it? Um, I want to steal man's I, argument. I, I I don't understand it. I want yeah. to steal man. Or I mean, I guess okay. To steal man, he said Plato himself didn't say it, but apparently a bunch of medieval philosophers did. I'm not sure which medieval philosophers he had in mind. Then he mentions Kant, who was not a medieval philosopher, and I don't remember Kant saying it should be one world government or that. So, so I think what he's talking about is that Kant has this essay that's called like toward perpetual peace. Uh, yeah. So yeah, Kant has like the cosmopolitan stuff, right? But yeah, but it's not really a one world. Is it a one world? Government? I don't think it is a one world government. Like I think it's yeah, that's not maybe if you're using how I remember it. Term in like a super broad way. I mean, like I think that the, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I think that like the I, I mean, as I recall, I mean, this is not fresh in my mind at all. But like I think no. that it's like, <laughs> uh, but. Um, that's a, I, that's, you know, I, I, I had a moment of almost feeling bad about talking about it under those circumstances that I realized that's like anything's about to come out of my mouth is going to be like 10,000 times more accurate than what we just heard. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, now, if we've learned anything here, just make proclamations about things you can't really remember and make them confidently. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think that like to a perpetual peace, I think Kant is talking about like different nations like coming to like a court or like maybe having something that would be like, you know, what he's describing almost sounds more like the idea for something like a UN, right? You know, that like you mm -hmm. have yeah. uh, some kind of like stable institutional mechanism for cooperation between different governments, which I don't, you know, doesn't really which is basically what Plato talked about, right? In the Republic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember that part. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I remember a lot about what like the <laughs> ideal city, you know, would would, would look like. Um, mm -hmm. But I also didn't even know it's like there's such a weird that guy who uh, earlier we were trying to remember nobody knew his name, so we just uh, I, I think the the dude who says that was the plan two thousand years ago uh, uh, that I believe that is the one they refer to as Moon Lord. That, that uh, is a detail. <laughs> so, no. uh, 
We'll, we'll, we'll just keep calling him Moon Lord. Yeah, there's, uh, there's another gentleman <laughs> named Weed Lord that has left the show and released a six-hour video about uh, uh, some of the stuff that's been going on at the uh, the Tim Compound, and okay. nobody's watched the six-hour video. <laughs> yeah, I got convinced that Weed Lord. We're, we're just not going to see watch that. Uh, mm. But I I can't even imagine how much Weed Weed Lord would smoke. That Moon Lord isn't the one who's referred to as Mean Lord, Weed Lord, because like, <laughs> like that guy just put on the computer screen, like just, it's like pig head with clouds of dirt behind him, just the cloud <laughs> trailing that guy. Uh, so we do have, uh, so I believe there's a little bit of confusion here, but the one we were starting to play earlier, I believe, is the one where we uh, we get a bit more background on, on Plato, right? There is a larger spiritual and energetic component to this that we definitely do not understand. But but it's interesting because you just mentioned that there there's th- these kind of individuals are calling for the same thing throughout many different years and many different decades. I, I absolutely agree with you. What are they calling for exactly? How would you explain that to the kind of normie Kyle and Karen out there? What think, are they calling for? What's the what's their goal? I think the elite ideology nowadays is wedded to a form of uh, extreme Darwinism, where it, there's a social Darwin a- Darwinian attitude that if you are in power, you have the right to be in power. And that goes along with the the belief that actually goes back to Plato and the Republic that the human population has to be kept at a certain level uh, for the ideal balance. Plato's whole system was based on Pythagoras's number mysticism. And so there's a lot of hoodoo in that. But what the, what today's elite have borrowed or taken from Plato isn't the idea of dialectics. And part of dialectics is that you have to do evil and good at the same time. Yeah, he also believed in the prob- problem, reaction, solution. That's exactly. where a lot of the larger uh, kind of um, um, you know, implementation of a lot of yeah, the programs Pl- that they do. Plato thinks that society should be controlled by a secret society that lies to the public it's called the noble lie and it's a it's a loose kind of technocratic model even though he didn't believe they didn't know about technology per se and the the way that we do in plato's republic you have discussions of techne which is the same idea the whole idea is that society should be run like a giant math program and so plato said the philosopher king goes and studies on a mountain for 30 years and learns math and then he comes back and he impresses upon the city on the society the mathematical geometrical principles of an ideal state. That's what the Republic is. And then in later books, he says that actually it should just run, be run by an oligarchy that is a secret society, <laughs> right? Wow. So yeah, and they have to lie to the public. And and Plato was famous for eugenics for uh, this idea of, you know, keeping the population at a very, very su- sustainable level. Um, and you, you know, he even says that n- not to feed the, the plebes meat. They gotta eat rice, they gotta eat kibble. That sounds familiar. Yeah, I've heard right? that before. Mm, but, yeah. That's Bill Gates's major pledge. Wow. And what they've been talking about at Davos. Um, c- continue. Go. Uh, we gotta get, get the numbers down. Uh, everybody's got to be eating some kibble. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> kibble. <laughs> Pretty much, that's what they have us eating, dog food. I, I, yeah, they, hold on. Hmm. Dog food is meat. No, not not the Chinese made stuff. There's a okay, whole. Okay, well, hold yeah, on. I don't know what dog food you're uh, getting for Atlas. No, I'm not getting the Chinese made. That's stuff. right. Good dog food is meat. A lot after World War II, they created dry animal food, dog and cat food. It used to be all meat, and then they're like, we need the meat for the troops, so let's create some new pharma thing, biopharma. I don't know what is in this bread that garbage. they're giving to cats. That it, what do you think? It's cat, your cat's not supposed to be fat. It's fat because it's eating bread. Like and cats can't digest that stuff. It's yeah, not, it, they're carnivores. Feed your animals carnivores. meat. Well, have you tried Beyond Kibble? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a new company called Beyond Kibble. So I used to. Uh, Plato's like one of my idols, but I just don't know a lot about well, him. Well, good guess. and bad in Plato. Why like, would you have an idol that, that you don't know much about? Yo, he thought Klaus Schwab was a nice guy. Come yeah. on. I mean, I've always looked up to the idea of Plato People are like, because I, of I, platonic I, love, things like that. Like this this concept that you can have brotherly love with humans is, is strictly platonic, apparently. Um, so uh, w- He's done a lot of good, but apparently. Platonic. And I love the idea of him sitting with Socrates who's tripping out, just saying the most crazy stuff, and he's writing it down. Yeah. Like, yo, I'm gonna rem- this world's going to remember this dude. So would you say like Plato is like the, the founding father of the, of the Illuminati? Uh, yeah, ultimately. So apparently Plato, I want to make sure I've got this right from, uh, from the video that we just watched. Uh, he, he was really into eugenics. Uh, he, uh-huh. he, 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 he didn't want, uh, he didn't want the plebes to eat meat, uh, but instead he wanted, mm-hmm. he wanted them to eat like vegetarian dog food, I think. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, he was the, uh, founder of the Illuminati. Yeah, yeah. And my favorite bit here is that he knows the word techne. It's like, well, see, right? He's into using technology to surveil the people, you know, because of the word techne, which. 
just mind blowing. Like so, this so, is just, so this what? Is yeah. Amazing. So what is techne? I guess without this becoming well. So techne. I mean, techne for Plato. Like you know, this is a concept for Plato. Like techne versus um, like uh, episteme. Like so, for Plato. Like, but but the thing is, for Plato, techne is lower, right? So techne is like techne is like the practical stuff. So it's like what the craftsmen do. It's what, um, by extension, for him, like what the poets do and the artists do. It's like, you know, it's representing, it's like our physical representation of, of and phys physical manifestation of the higher world of the form. So like, you know, for Plato, like there's pure knowledge, the pure reflection, being the philosopher, you get the highest knowledge. And then there's this lower base technique stuff, which is just like the craftsmen and, you know, they operate a role, they, they, they have a role in the city state, but yeah, it's not like, the Illuminati using technology to, to, to monitor the. So yeah, let's say sure. yeah, let's say I, this I, is a. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, I just I'm. Just you know, tech to just, technocrats has to do amazed. with technology. Yeah, there you go, there you go, right? I mean, we have a we have a lot of modern words with the techne root, so that must have been what Plato. All of that is what Plato was talking about. Right. I just wanted to say real Probably. quick, uh, if yeah. uh, let's say an undergraduate student wrote something gave an oral presentation on um, on this subject and that was the content what would your yeah. what would your assessment be i'm serious would it, it would it be that oh they they did they read it did they skim it and just get all the wrong ideas i'm just really curious what you my would assessment say. would be that they saw the word techne <laughs> and then just made up a bunch of stuff based <laughs> on the word techne <laughs> what about the overall you'd be like oh they're just like like yeah i don't know i yeah, okay. would, yeah. Would you, like you did not read, you, like you saw a word, and that's all. <laughs> it's like you gave a word to Chat GPT and had it spit something out. <laughs> because he said it so confidently. I just, he's just, yeah, just so confident. He's just tech day. It's the Illuminati. It's the uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you say it's the no. Illuminati? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, I would. Yes, I would say. yes, I would. Yes, I, I would. would. Next question. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. That is real. Like when they say improv comedy, I always say yes and. <laughs> listen. That's right. Yeah, the producers, That's right. the, the producers in the green room say, "Now listen, whatever anyone says on the on the, on the show, just <laughs> go with say it and yes. make it and make it more conspiratorial." Yes, <laughs> yes. that is a hundred percent correct. Yeah, would you say that Plato was himself a wizard person? Well, certainly, but uh, uh, you know, yeah. Well, I would yeah. say yes with one caveat. I'm not sure that goes far enough. I'm not. I'm not sure yeah. that that <laughs> he is the founder of the <laughs> wizard people. In fact, <laughs> so real quick, real quick, because we might have some dialectic experts here. Is it that you have to be both good and evil? <laughs> it, it's I like, mean, uh... wait, are we doing? Are we doing Hegel here? I, I don't. I'm, I'm not a Hegel guy. Well, I'm not a Hegel guy. Because like he, because he was talking about. Plato or I mean like like at various points we've yeah. been talking about Plato, Kant or unnamed medieval philosophers. I didn't actually remember Hegel being mentioned, but somehow or no. another they said something about the dialectic and dialectical mm -hmm. something something. Like Aristotle yeah. talked about dialectics, but I not in any sense that I could figure out how it's related to that. Yeah. But he said the word dialectic, and that's you know, just like Plato said the word well, they both said the word techne, so you know, and the mean both, they it's both like love the, the Illuminati, obviously. It's it, like the yeah. Osmonds, you know, you got to be a little bit evil, good, and a little bit evil. You know, what I liked about uh, that one is so something actually Ryan I remember said to me a while back is it's like really funny that it's like, okay, like when I debated Charlie Kirk in 2021, he was like really hot and bothered about Plato, about Hegel as the source of all, all evil, but you know, it's like it's, it's, you know, Hegel's really. Uh, is really where all the bad stuff starts and you know and that's um like to like a pretty ludicrous extent like like when we were talking about marx at one point of that that debate like charlie was like really concerned to show that like marx was really a hegelian which is sort of weird because you would think the conservative thing would be that like hegel is bad because he leads to marx not that like marx is bad because he's he's really like, <laughs> hegelian but anyway yeah. um mm -hmm. And then, like, I remember there was a point where somebody put out an article, uh, like some you know, right-wing, you know, freedom enterprise, something, something kind of website about how Kant was really like the father of wokeness, uh, and um, and it's like, okay, that's pretty good. 
But I remember Ryan pointed out around that time, it's like, well, surely eventually these guys have got to discover Descartes, right? I mean, that like that's yeah. the that's got to be the primordial, you know, woke mind virus mm-hmm. stuff because he's telling you to question everything. Yeah. But Tim Pool, you know, has really done one much better than that. You know, it's 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 Plato. Plato's the bad guy. Like, like, look, I understand Moon Lord thinks that Plato is beautiful because he talks about brotherly love. Mm. But I do want to complete uh, the Tim Pool tour of the history of Western philosophy. No, I got uh, I went to an antique store, a couple of them. Uh, in West Virginia, because there's tons. People love antiquing out here. And I, I was able to buy hundreds of Life magazine going all the way back. I got, I think I have the first issue, actually, which was like a couple hundred bucks. I was really excited to get it. And we're going to be putting at the new studio, like a viewing library where you can go back and read all of the contextual perspectives. It was It is, it is crazy to read about World War II before they knew what was going on. Nuts. In one of the, one of the magazines, they're like, the U.S. sent defensive machinery and equipment to the U.K. to prevent an invasion. And it basically shows the armaments for D-Day. Like we now know the U.S. was sending weapons so they could storm the beaches of Normandy. Back then, it was reported that they were just defending the U.K. Oh, you mean the news was lying to people for military <laughs> game? Really? Well, I mean, look, I don't yeah, expect no. them to be like, we're going to invade. Yeah, of course, you know no. What I mean? like, the whole thing was a subterfuge played on the Germans, essentially. So they didn't know when they were coming or where they were it, coming from. It really is. These these magazines are incredible to like read history in the perspective of the day with no foreknowledge, having the gift of hindsight to read like it's it's just a crazy thing to read someone, a journalist be so wrong about Dude, everything. It's part of why we need to preserve our data and why censorship is dangerous and why we need like external sources of data collection, because we need like our, our data should be in orbit in glass in case a meteor annihilates the surface so that we can see what the mistakes we made along the way and all the things like what you're talking about, how we manipulated our enemies in the past, how they can be manipulating us right now. Mm-hmm. Do you think that when the Soviet Union was falling apart with this this concerted effort to make the Russians and the Austrian Hungarian empire disappear that when, cause I think when they split up the Soviet union, the oligarchs or whoever split it up, gave the black sea to Ukraine. They took right. it away from Russia. They didn't yeah. want them to have Mediterranean access. So was that, you think that was intentional? Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, that's a classic strategic area. Ukraine is right. So uh, Hitler had that as a really important area when he was trying to, you know, go against Russia. Um, but the cold war in my view was, was a managed dialectic ultimately. I mean, not saying it didn't, I mean, my uncle was like a, you know, air force guy in the cold war. So I'm not saying that people didn't do stuff, but, uh, at the at a higher level, you know, these are the people who wanted there to be a dialectic between, you know, Eastern capital or uh, Western capitalism and Eastern Soviet bloc communism to smash the two together. And what you get out of that is what's called a third way synthesis. And even back in the day in the in like the 30s, Bertrand Russell was writing in Scientific Outlook as a high level, you know, elite planner at the Royal Society. He was writing and saying that he says, quote, the experiment in Russia under Stalin is going great. Tim has picked perhaps the one example that will uh, that will get me to uh, to defend the U.S. military against the claim that they're aligned about a war. <laughs> and, uh, like this idea that while well, we were pretending we were sending weapons to Britain to defend them against possible invasion, but really we know that was just like a subterfuge because we were like planning on like storming like the beaches and Normandy. It's like okay. Um, the U.S. was sending arms to Britain to defend them against a possible Nazi invasion. There's, there's like, it's, it's not like there was a, you know, it's not like FDR had like the plans for D-Day at his desk from like, you know, 1933 onward, and they, they just like, you know, it's like, all right, when are we ready to get to move to step three of the the program? Like, like literally, like literally, like the the Nazis were attacked, like bombing the UK and the US, the sort of process of the US being drawn into the war was, you know, was about like sending them, you know, like propping up the, uh, propping up the British defense, you know, by, with like lead lease, you know, sending them, you know, sending them weapons, all that stuff. And, um, you know, long before the US entered the, the war, I mean, just this idea that it's like any like, you know, it's like, well, this reminds me of something I saw in a picture of storming the beaches at D-Day once. So, like, so this this must have really been the secret plan to do that. 
and this whole yeah, it's, it's, it's ben, you, you're, you're, it's you're getting it wrong, wrong man it's like the center of a uh, new american century they like had the plan to take out the nazis years before <laughs> we even got in the war i mean mm -hmm. why do you think jack kirby created captain america I... <laughs> that's a good point that's a good point <laughs> Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, so that's the first part is that, like, we were really just pretended to be arming the, the British to, uh, you know, for their war effort when, like, they were literally being, like, the, the you know, Luftwaffe was bombing the shit out of them, you know, years before the U.S. entered the war. That's one thing. But then, uh, then Moon Lord has a really interesting suggestion about how all of these lessons of history that Tim is, is laying down knowledge about mean that we need to preserve our data and in case there's an asteroid and he has like a really specific thought about what the preserving the data would look like. Got to put the data in like some sort of glass structure that's, that's orbited, that's orbited the earth. So if all of humanity, like, Maybe not all of humanity, because then who's the data for? But like, uh, there's some sort of catastrophic civilization ending asteroid event. Then this this satellite with all of our data. Uh, well, has anybody thought about this? Is anybody working on this? The, their understanding of the breakup of the Soviet Union, which is that somehow the West did something to take the Black Sea away from Russia, which I'm not sure I was following that part at all. Um, Bertrand uh, Russell wants there to be a dialectic between the Soviet Union and oh my god I love the way that that thing about ultimately the Cold War was a managed dialectic because uh, people wanted this dialectic between Western capitalism and Soviet communism but then he sort of hesitates he's like oh wait my uncle. Did I just go too crazy? Because what about my uncle who's in the army or whatever? He, he had the kid yeah. like visions of like his uncle like being like, "You're a good boy. Like I believe in you. I love you. And whatever you choose to do with your life, like I support you." And then he's basically saying that like my uncle died. You know, he risked his life in vain. Uh, but is a dialectic something you can aim for as like a policy choice? Is that I thought it was a tool of analysis. Am I wrong? <laughs> um I mean, yeah i <laughs> can't maybe can you be like i yeah. really want there to be a dialectic between is, yeah is it... I, I mean a lot of the i mean i think a lot of the hegel stuff is like interpretive uh wiggle room to put it mildly about how uh what we're uh uh like how much you know are we make it like a uh, an epistemic claim or like is, is this like you're saying like a sort of methodological tool that like this is something that's going to help you understand something or are you making like a metaphysical claim about the the way that the thing itself works right that there's this like you know dialectical structure sure sure history goes forward or whatever but that's still descriptive I don't know, right? what, I don't know what the fuck it has to do with what <laughs> i was talking about because i it, it seems like yeah to the extent that i'm yeah, finding I, I, thought, like I think it's like it was like they were just pretending to have a cold war. Uh, when Bertrand Russell is a high level planner at the Royal Society, uh, but he's also thought, a communist. No, uh, yeah. no. I mean that's like literally just not at all true. I mean like like Bertrand Russell. No, but I think they said he was a communist, right? No, no, they did. But it's like you know Bertrand Russell okay. was. Like, was like a socialist, certainly, but like he visited before Stalin came to power. I mean, he visited the Soviet Union and the slave met with Lenin and, you know, was, and sort of came away not a fan. Uh, and um, so I don't know what this what this thing is about Bertrand Russell supposedly saying Stalin was great. I kind of think that's probably not true, but you know, if, if some uh, somebody's watching this and they're like, "Oh, I know exactly what he's talking about," feel free to you know to send me uh, to send me the. Mm -hmm. the Russell endorses Stalin passage, but um, but also uh, I'm just fascinated by this thing about how Bertrand Russell in this telling is like a um, is a high level planner at the Royal Society, like that he was like he was like one of the puppet masters in the British establishment, I guess, right? Like the mm -hmm. like one of those yeah. those first clips that we watched 
there was something that went by so quickly, none of us even commented on it, about how yeah. uh, Ian Fleming and Noel Coward got, like, got the U.S. to start the CIA, which... <laughs> You know, just gonna just gonna put a you know citations needed on that one. In this version of Bertrand Russell, like um, who's he's part of the uh, the people the managed dialectic, right? So it's like either like a fake conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union that is pretended to fight, or maybe they're fighting for real, but it was like a plan to like ig on both sides to have this managed dialectic so that that would lead to I don't know the war in ukraine 2022 or something i think i i kind of lose the thread of it at that point but um then it had uh but like bertrand russell like was actually not like you know like this idea that like bertrand russell was like uh you know hanging around some like shadowy office under you know ted Downing street you know, like planning, you know, planning what the, the British state was going to do. I mean, like, this is a guy who served time in, in prison for his opposition to World War I. Um, he was, uh, like, you know, he was, like, very, like, he was a, he was a hippie. I mean, he was, he was really into, you know, he was a, he was a socialist, he was a pacifist, he, like, talked, uh, he was, uh, you know, talked a lot about like free love and stuff like that. He had uh, um, one of the last things that he did in like the final years of his life was like start a, uh, a tribunal with John Paul Sartre to like expose U.S. war crimes in Vietnam. Like this is, I, I, I just love the fact that this is the name they've glommed on to as like the, the sort of representative of the lizard people. Well, you know, it's the dialectic. He's got a good side. He's got a bad side. The only pushback I actually think in all those clips that we actually saw in anything was when the guest was like very gently pushing back against Moon Lord, suggested that the plan to do whatever, you know, whatever the conspiracy behind the war in Ukraine is, that that was the plan, you know, for like the one world government, that like that was the plan 2,000 years ago with Plato. And Mm -hmm. he was like, well... Plato might not, (laughs) you know, but basically, right? (laughs) Yeah, basically, basically, the medieval philosophers running with Plato. If not Plato, then surely, surely the medieval Platonists, you know, like they they had all this, you know. And if not, then then surely Kant. And if not, then Hegel, obviously. So I just want to review um, Plato, founder of the Illuminati. uh, was very into tech day, which probably has something to do with technological surveillance. Um, mm-hmm. Kant uh, advocated uh, one world government, um, and uh, and and Bertrand Russell. Kant and Russell. Yes, Kant and Russell were doing the world government phase of uh, of, mm-hmm. of the the Plato the Plato program, which it turns out is not merely about brotherly love. Uh, but uh, but but is about um, I don't know wokeness or Marxism or something like that. Um, so this yeah, is I think we pretty much got it. Yeah, and Pfizer. Don't forget Pfizer. Pfizer mind control drugs. Right, right. And all of it. That make, that the Pfizer mind control drugs that make Project Veritas board members uh, want mm-hmm. to uh, to coup James O'Keefe on behalf of Pfizer. Mm-hmm. And the uh, world globalist elite. Um, look, I feel so embarrassed that Sam Cedar didn't even know what uh, deontological and consequentialist uh, were. Like Tim and his buddies <laughs> know so much about the history of philosophy. <laughs> You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>